Welcome, everybody. Um, we finally made it. Um, welcome. Uh, my name's Ken Horrigan. I'm the president of the Churchill Fellows Association of Queensland and uh, chair of the Convention Organising Committee. Uh, I would like to welcome you all to the 2021 National Convention of Churchill Fellows, a changing world. Um, I would like to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Turrbal and Yuggera people, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. We'll start with a pre-recorded Welcome to Country by Maruchi Baramba. Songwoman Maruchi is the songwoman and lawwoman of the Turrbal people, the, the uh, original habitants of, inhabitants of Brisbane and the Dipple people of the Sunshine Coast area. She is a direct descendant of Ducky Tucker, chief of the old Brisbane tribe. Please welcome songwoman Marucci. That means welcome to Brisbane in the language of the Thurubal people. My name is Maruchi Baramba, which means the black swan from those people who sing up the wind. We are the descendants of Daki Yaka, the healer. Daki Yaka's name was anglicised to the Duke of York back in the 1830s. He was the chief of the old Brisbane tribe, not the North Brisbane tribe, not the South Brisbane tribe, but the Brisbane tribe. According to Tom Petrie of a founding family of modern day Brisbane, the Turrbal lands went from the Logan River in the South to the Limba Creek in the North and inland as far as Mogul. Also, according to Tom Petrie, after a, a, an inquiry into the activities of the natives police back in the 19, oh, sorry, the 1860s, in fact, 1861, Tom Petrie mentioned that he had known of five of the old Turbal people having been left after a population that went into the thousands. We survived because of the Duke of York's daughter, Kukarua. She went up to her mother's family up in the Sunshine Coast. When they, uh, the treatment of Aborigines here and the culture clash here in the Brisbane area became unbearable and the decimation of our population was um, so bad. Kukarua was a song woman, and we ourselves are song women as well. I have two daughters and they also sing. We are here today representing our people, our ancestors. And I shall now sing the blessing of the gathering as it, it is commonly done for the people of Southeastern Queensland. In fact, my mother's tribal father was documented as the last chief of all the tribes of South Brisbane, South, yeah, of South Queensland, I'm sorry. South Queensland because by the time my mother was born, all of the Aborigines in Queensland was rounded up and put onto reserves. Once we were put onto those reserves, we were, we still kept our little societal groups no matter what happened. So um, we still kept our songs and dances alive in those places and the Queensland government uh, policy of the day, uh, particularly with the statute, also encouraged the um, preservation of Aboriginal song and dance. In fact, whenever the Queensland government wanted an Aboriginal dance troupe or ex exhibits of Aboriginal artefacts, they always got their... Um, uh, the Aboriginal um, 
dancers and craftsmen from Cherbourg, where I was born. Initially, Cherbourg was called Baramba. I shall now, um, well, wish you all the very best. I generally sing the song, but um, of the blessing, but now I shall um, just wish you all the very best for, for your gathering today, and I only hope that the best things can come out of it. And um, I shall finish on a song actually from Sherbrooke called Gari Nina Nami. Was what? Gari Nina Nami, Jujumo Biranu, Gari Nina Nami, Gari Nina Nami, Jujumo Biranu, Gari Nina Nami, Jujumo Biranu. Thank you, Songwoman Marucci, for that warm welcome and for sharing your story with us. Songwoman Marucci has a long and successful history in performing arts and was the first Indigenous Australian to perform on the Australian operatic stage. And uh, it's a shame we couldn't hear, be here in pre uh, present to hear um, Marucci sing the full uh, welcome blessing because it is quite moving. I've, I've heard Marucci a few times. Now, traditionally, I would, I would now acknowledge the dignitaries and special guests present, but the list is very long uh, and many will be introduced later in the program as keynote speakers and uh, moderators and such. So I'll ask your forgiveness and move on to the program. Uh, thank you all for attending this convention. Thanks in particular for our wonderful speakers and moderators for their forbearance uh, understanding, flexibility, and good humour as they rode this convention roller coaster with us over the past two years. I will quickly introduce the convention committee. I do have a few of them here with me at the State Library today. So the convention committee is Inspector Paul Biggin, Damien Salmon, Sharon Gilchrist, Maura Solly, Dr. Melanie White, Jane Milburn, we have Jill Bannon, the convention organiser, and Dr. Kirsty Gusta has been leading the virtual components. So Sharon and Damien, do you want to stick your heads into a shot here and give everyone a, a wave? <laughs> you can see they're masked up. We're all compliant with the uh, restrictions. So thank you, guys. Um, <laughs> We're all wearing these uh, red T-shirts as well. The idea was that you could spot us in the crowd and come up and ask us questions. But uh, we're, just, we're still wearing this, the T-shirts, even though we're here by ourselves. Now, um, normally I would spend some time regaling you with the colourful account of the convention you're about to experience. But instead, I'll spend a few minutes explaining the difficult decision that I was recently forced to make to flip the event from hybrid to fully virtual. I know that it's been difficult for some people and I sincerely apologize for that. As you know, the event we had carefully crafted for you was an in-person gathering of Churchill Fellows from around Australia to connect, inspire, showcase and share experiences. Due to COVID restrictions, we deferred the convention from May to October this year and though we were and thought that we were in the clear but then new south wales victoria and the act went into lockdown and delegates and presenters from those areas were unable to travel the trust brought events air on board so that we could still deliver the convention as a hybrid event with the intention that most presenters would be in person but a few could attend virtually Gradually over time, most uh, attendees from other states and territories changed their registrations to virtual. The State Library of Queensland AV staff was extremely helpful in accommodating our changes, but there were technological limits to how many speakers could attend virtually in the various rooms. We have been carefully monitoring attendance numbers and shifting presentations around different rooms as the number of virtual presenters increased. And we're getting close to the tipping point where the hybrid event could not proceed in, uh, any further. As recently as two weeks ago, we were still feeling confident 
when we held the successful 2021 medallion reception here at the State Library of Queensland. But then we had a few COVID cases in the community and restrictions were tightened. The Art, Queensland Art Gallery was forced to cancel the welcome reception as it didn't meet the, didn't meet the new restrictions. We successfully worked with the State Library of Queensland and Customs House to modify the event uh, to meet the new requirements with the very low or zero COVID cases in the community, we thought we might just skate through. However, this week we had several presenters advise that they just couldn't attend in person for various reasons. The retrospective nature of COVID restrictions and quarantine orders, should there be community transmission in Brisbane, is a real worry for anyone traveling any distance to attend the convention and we understand and fully support these decisions. After many hours of discussion, the CFAQ Convention Organising Committee and the Trust agreed that a hand was forced and we must advise all attendees the convention must now be held as a virtual online event. Uh, the decision was not made lightly. It has been extremely disappointing for all of us, not the le least for me personally, as has been two years effort in crafting this event, to feel like we have fallen at the final hurdle. It is not the event we'd hoped and planned for, and I understand it's not the event many of you had expected. Fortunately though, the events air training, at, uh, the presenters have been most understanding and have undertaken the events air training at this late stage to ensure that we deliver the same rich and inspired content. Some are more experienced than others in virtual platforms. So please make allowances for those like me who are new to this. I do believe that we have been courageous in taking the convention this far and holding as a virtual event will still be a significant achievement at this time. Many other conventions and conferences have just been canceled outright. So I think we all should be very proud of what that we have persevered the dinner will still proceed as planned. Uh, so I hope that makes up for some of the loss of in-person contact. I won't quote Sir Winston Churchill as I'm certain that many speakers will be quoting the great orator over the next two days. Uh, and I don't want to steal their thunder. So I'll leave it to everyone else to come up with the uh, perfect Winston quotes. But I will conclude again by thanking our speakers and moderators as well as the tour leaders and entertainers we'd arranged for components of the convention that now cannot proceed. We really appreciate your efforts and commitment. I would like to thank the venues, the caterers, Events Air, the Trust, the CFAQ Organising Committee for the goodwill and investment they have all made to bring this event to you, particularly convention organiser Jill Bannon and the lead for the virtual aspects, Dr. Kirsty Gusta from the Trust, they have both really gone above and beyond. Right, so now that that's under the way, uh, out of the way, uh, we will get going with the convention proper. I will now introduce Professor Tom Karma, AO, patron of the Winston Churchill Trust. Professor Karma is an Aboriginal elder from the Kungarakan tribal group and a member of the Iwaji tribal group. Apologies, Tom, for my mispronunciation of those words. Uh, whose traditional lands are southwest of Darwin and on the Coburg Peninsula in the Northern Territory. He has been involved in Indigenous affairs at all levels and worked in the public sector for 45 years. And is currently a number of, on a number of boards and committees focusing on rural remote Australia, health, mental health, suicide prevention, education, justice, reinvestment, research, reconciliation and economic development. Professor Karma was the ACT, 2013 ACT Australian of the Year and in 2014 became the sixth Chancellor of the University of, Queens, of Canberra, sorry, uh, the first Indigenous male Chancellor of a Australian university. Please welcome Professor Karma. Okay, so I'm live. Uh, excellent. Well, good afternoon or good morning if you're in WA. 
I've titled my presentation today, A Changing World or Ch I begin by recognizing and paying my respects to the traditional owners of the lands we're all calling in from today and pay my respects to elders past and present. I'm Kung Arakan and Iwaja and I'm coming to you from the Larrakia Nation in Darwin and I pay my respects to the Larrakia peoples who are my traditional and cultural neighbors. I respect their culture, their knowledges and their connection to country. Their people have lived, loved and raised their families and cared for this country for millennia before the arrival of the British that saw the subsequent disposal of lands, cultures and languages across the nation. The introduction of Western diseases, including a pandemic or two. I would also like to acknowledge all youth, yes, Indigenous and non-Indigenous youth, who will be our future leaders and the custodians of our stories, our languages, our histories and our cultures. And I emphasise youth because at the last census, over 50% of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population was under 14 years of age. I also recognise the Turrbal and Yagara people um, and thank Maruchi Baramba Songwoman for your generous welcome to country. Thank you, Ken, for your welcome. And it's great to learn we have so many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and non-Indigenous Churchill Fellows and community members And a big shout out to my fellow patron, the Honourable Margaret White AO, the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust members and CEO, Adam Davey. It brings me great pleasure to help um, uh, the Trust launch this biennial National Fellows Convention with the theme, A Changing World. Indeed, what a changing world it is. Climate change, geopolitical change, technological revolutions and COVID-19 are all upon us and all at the same time. Well, just focusing on COVID-19 for now, um, it helps me to think of four varieties of change or potential for change associated with the pandemic that I will consider in my welcome. First are the changes to ordinary life, to work, to work and home life balance, um, greater reliance on technology when it works, to travel, and to homeschooling and so on that have flowed from lockdowns and quarantines. And up front, I acknowledge the many Churchill Fellows and essential service workers who are working towards supporting the Australian community during this challenging time. Second has been COVID's ability to force us to reflect on changes that were underway and seemed unstoppable prior to the pandemic and yet have shown themselves to be unflatteringly light under pandemic conditions. For example, political polarisation and popularism, individualism at the expense of collectivism, and social media as a vector for disinformation. Third is the way COVID has highlighted the need for structural change, particularly to address inequalities within nations and between nations and based on a pandemic has caused reinvigorated understanding that we are all in this together. Now, one of the most challenging Australian pandemic images is surely that of the long caravan convoys heading into regional New South Wales. Able people um, with COVID to quarantine and to protect their families and kin. COVID has, of course, merely brought decades of housing neglect and the tolerance of overcrowding in these communities to a head. But I'm forced to reflect on what would have happened if a similar response to um, the decades of appalling housing related conditions like overcrowding, um, uh, rheumatic heart disease, otitis media, scabies, trachoma, poor education and employment uh, participation that are all endemic in many of the same communities had occurred. The caravan convoys were for me uh, emblematic of the need for continuing work to address the structural causes of the marginalization, poverty, and ill health affecting far too many Indigenous communities. Now, this leads to the fourth category of change that has come with COVID, and which I am most optimistic about, the opportunity to implement structural change. And it is for this fourth context that I believe Churchill Fellowships are more important than ever. To navigate these potentials, 
for change requires new ways of thinking. And this is what the Churchill Trust is ex exemplary in supporting through the fellowships program. To quote Victor Hugo, there is nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. Indeed, for my time as social justice commissioner, I know the power of ideas from my founding of the Close the Gap campaign for Indigenous health equality in 2007. Close or closing the gap is shorthand for the simple idea of progressively realising Indigenous health equality. It involves working in partnership with Indigenous peoples, quantifying health gaps with the non-Indigenous community, planning to close the gaps, setting timeframes to close the gaps and adequately resourcing the responses needed. And while, as highlighted by the caravan convoys, the closing the gap journey is far from over, it has nonetheless made closing the gap a core bipartisan goal of all Australian governments. It's channeled billions of dollars of investment towards improving Indigenous lives, resulting in real improvements in health, education and so on. But there is still a way to go. Facilitating ongoing structural changes, such as those in the 2020 National Closing the Gap Agreement, whereby Australian governments uh, have committed to power sharing with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples for the first time. And it only took 14 years and a lot of advocacy to achieve this outcome. So never give up. By closing the gap, um, I should say, but closing the gap is not only an example of the power of, of ideas and fresh thinking to shift structural changes, it is also an example of Indigenous thought leadership and therefore, as I'll explain, structural change in itself. Structural inequalities is fundamentally about entrenching power relationships within societies and structural changes uh, or change is largely about transferring power, particularly decision-making power from the powerful to those who are not. And being part of a structural change by empowering Indigenous and non-Indigenous thought leaders and leadership in decision-making is exactly the role the Trust has played for many decades now and another reason why I'm proud to be a Trust patron. In just the past five years, the Trust has continued to support and empower Indigenous fellows to develop areas including Indigenous parliaments and government uh, governance mechanisms, strategies for Indigenous economic empowerment and engagement, cross-cultural education, best practice in Indigenous child protection, housing and acute rheumatic fever prevention, and support for Aboriginal women birthing on country. Indeed, there have been 57 Indigenous scholarly recipients of trust support since 1967. And to repeat, in taking on this role, the trust has demonstrated that it is not just a supporter of change, but is willing to be a part of structural change itself. Now, structural change in society is one of my great interests. Indeed, supporting structural changes that empower and benefit Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples has been my life's work. And so I was provided with some great opportunity for reflection when I was asked to write an essay about the legacy of Winston Churchill and the Winston Churchill Fellowship Trust earlier this year. Now, this included reference to the ongoing debates around the place of commemorative statues of people like Churchill uh, in the light of their documented holding of racist and imperialist attitudes and the call for many of these statues to be removed. And make, my, and make no mistake, these are attitudes that have directly and, and negatively affected me, my family and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples everywhere. And that underpins the very structural forces in society of argued need change. I also need to state clearly that these are attitudes that I, of course, along with the trust itself, wholeheartedly reject. But after a time of reflection, I came to the conclusion that while on a case by case basis, some statues should be removed, that to take such statues down without consideration also can, uh, carry significant risk. Now, the first risk is that removing a statue without in-depth consideration could be seen as supporting um, a, a zero-sum way of thinking, including about, but not limited to, historical figures. That is, 
thinking that did not allow room for human complexity, the norms of the day, or the notion that the good in a person or their achievements cannot be celebrated alongside a clear-eyed comprehension of that which uh, was not so good is vicarious. The viewpoint that Trust and myself have about Churchill recognises these complexities. <clears throat> and more broadly, it is our firm belief that nuanced, rigorous, critical, but nonetheless compassionate thinking is needed more than ever if we are to confront the contemporary challenges of popularism, political polarisation, and the spread of misinformation that I've referred to. In other words, it is as important to support ways of thinking that a more nuanced attitude towards the statues in bodies as it is to support populist ideas. The second risk was that to remove a statue might be passing up invaluable education opportunities about such figures and the worlds they inhabited. Opportunities and understanding that in themselves might contribute to structural change. By this, I mean plaques and contextual information that sets out the not so good or the placement of other statues nearby to commemorate the struggle of being oppressed to provide balance might be a better way to go. The third risk I identified was that statue removal might be confused with structural change, as if the removal of symbols associated with structural inequality was enough. My point is that racism and colonialism are real issues in Australian society and will continue with the statues of Churchill or whoever uh, um, were on display or they were removed. And further, it was to these entrenched attitudes, in some cases so deeply held and sublimated as to be unrecognised, that the bulk of activism's energy um, for structural change should be directed. In other words, I call for deep reflection on how such statues are treated and understanding of pitfalls that their removal might involve. Now, I close my talk today with a challenge to all Churchill Fellows present uh, at the next, uh, over the next few days. And that is to think beyond the biennial convention and to work out ways to work collaboratively and to harness the collective knowledge, enthusiasm and, and passion uh, to change the status quo and support the structural changes I've discussed. And to that end, I welcome the first meeting of the Indigenous Churchill Fellows Network this afternoon in a session that I have the honour of chairing. I look forward to meeting or meeting again the Indigenous Fellows who will comprise the network and, and to getting the network operational. It is my hope that this network provides a template for many such collaborative networks amongst Fellows, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous. So as you begin this convention uh, with its fa fascinating topics, including women in leadership, the environment, education, health, justice and community safety, and artisan producers, I hope I've left you with some food for thought about the need more than ever for firstly, critical, rigorous, and yet compassionate thinking that embraces complexities in any given area of study. Secondly, thought leaders and leadership towards change in general. And thirdly, the empowerment of indigenous and other marginalized groups uh, group thought leaders as being a part of the structural change I've discussed. And finally, that you share my support and thanks for the trust past, present and future roles in supporting these very important goals. All the best for the convention. I'm, no, I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Thank you for listening and stay safe and COVID free. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Khan, um, for that opening address. Uh, and I'll be reflecting on your your thoughts about the the, sim the symbols of structural inequality uh, throughout the convention. I think there's um, uh, a, a lot to think about in that space, particularly. Um, and so, thank you for for bringing that up. Uh, I've got, I'm not sure if I'm meant to be mentioning comments from the audience, but we've got a comment here from J Jeremy H saying, it's always good to hear from uncle. He has been a strong leader for our mob here on Baramatagal land. So I no doubt pronounce that incredibly incorrectly. So 
apologies for that. Um, but uh, thank you, Tom. That was wonderful. Now, the next session, I think, I think what I have to do, I'm learning is this as much as you guys are, I think I have to ask you all to leave this session and then sign into the Women in Leadership session, uh, which is the next session we'll go to. So I'll see you in the next room.